All right, let's get started. 10 a 10 a.m. Eastern time here. Welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Eisman. I'm the coordinator and moderator of this LTAD chat. Uh, I want to welcome you um, to this edition of it. This is the live version here on Zoom. Um, for those of you who this is your first time attending uh, one of these live sessions, a little bit of background. This is really an extension of something that we've been doing monthly um, called LTAD chat on Twitter. Uh, where I typically will pose five or six questions and then anyone who, wa who wants to respond to it, they may do so and then interact with others. Um, so we've held, I think, seven or eight of those now. And what we wanted to do is bring that format um, to a live version, continue to cover and highlight topics that we're all interested in related to youth and adolescent physical activity, physical fitness and athleticism. Um, and also allow as many voices as we can to show and share uh, an evidence-based approach, but also evidence-led uh, experiences and perspectives as well um, in this community of learning and engagement. This is episode four of the live version. In episode one, uh, we started with a panel discussion and just got at that question of what is long-term athlete or athletic development? Um, and also how can it be sold to stakeholders within your schools, organization, uh, and community. And then in episode two, um, last Saturday, we had Mike Jennings from Athos Academy discuss the intersection of, uh, long-term athletic development and physical education. Both of those sessions were recorded and they're available online. I'm going to be posting a link, um, as we go, uh, through the show this morning. Um, in the chat box and actually that might be a good time just for some uh, general uh, teleconferencing 101 uh, number one you you are on camera uh, unless you've turned it off which is totally fine uh, so just mind your actions um, there's some interesting stories that are being shared <laughs> related to uh, what people are are doing uh, on camera during some of these teleconferences. Second is you are on audio um, as well, so mind the mute button. Um, and the same goes for the chat box. So I um, want to encourage everybody to use the chat box, but just remember everything is being recorded, including everything in the chat box. So private conversations, fine, saying hello to somebody, fine, going back and forth with somebody on what the presenter is talking about, all fine and we want to encourage that because we want to encourage this interaction and dialogue and networking in this form as well but just as a reminder all that's also being recorded as well um, and if you want to share something privately just make sure that you're sharing it with the right person not with everybody if you want to keep it private um, but just as a reminder all that's being recorded as well um, so let's get into today's uh, topic and with our, our guest uh, today, the topic is designing and running a comprehensive unified strength and conditioning program from the middle school right up through into the high school. And I'm delighted to have uh, four coaches, two from each school district, uh, one coach being from the middle school, one from the high school to share their approaches and experiences on this topic. Uh, from Farmington, Minnesota, we have Scott Meyer and Chad Olson. And from Traverse City, Michigan, uh, Doug Glee and John Gurton. And I'm, I'm going to let them introduce themselves as we get through to this first question. Um, and I have a second question, but again, I want to really encourage people to use the chat box to pose questions. And then we can have these individuals field those questions or just unmute yourself um, at a natural pause and ask a question as well. That's, that's fine. Um, and so to get started, let's just have each group kind of lay out the landscape. What's the landscape in your community and in your school district so that we can provide some context for everybody? Um, because we may have people from smaller communities or from larger communities. And we also have people from other parts of the world where this sort of school district model um, may be a bit uh, different. So 
Uh, I don't care which group goes first, but uh, a little bit of an introduction of yourselves. And then again, just laying out the landscape within your school district and community to provide some context to the conversation today. Doug, go ahead. All right. Uh, my name is Doug Glee. We're up in Traverse City, Michigan. So if you're familiar with uh, Michigan, we're about straight across um, Lake Michigan from uh, with, like Milwaukee area, Green Bay area, somewhere, somewhere in the middle of those two. Um, our high, we have two high schools in our town. Um, we have two middle schools that feed those high schools. Our high school is about 1,400. Um, the other high school is about 1,600. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty affluent community, but we also have a lot of Title I and uh, poverty in our school district. So it's, it makes for a pretty uh, diverse group. Yeah, um, uh, I'm from Farmington. We're uh, a, suburban, a suburban community just kind of south of the Twin Cities metro area. We're kind of like in the outer ring of suburbs. So we're about a half hour drive from uh, downtown Minneapolis or St. Paul. Um, we haven't been taken over by urban sprawl yet. We still have some farmland and some open areas and it's kind of a, kind of a blue collar community compared to some other uh, suburbs, I think. Um, but we have uh, five elementary schools that feed into two middle schools. Um, the, the middle schools are grades six through eight, and then we have one high school, uh, nine through 12, and our enrollment at right now is about 2,200 students. So um, we're kind of one of those growing communities and our student population continues to grow. Great, so let, let's get into a little bit more detail here. Um, and again, I think this question is gonna open up uh, a can of worms and um, foster some, some dialogue. Uh, so the way that I've always thought about long-term athletic development is very similar to school. So in school, we have math, science, English, social studies, and long-term athletic development, our subjects can be, we can think of them as technical, tactical, physical, or mental, but let's just stick with, for now, the physical domain of that. So if we think about speed, strength, mobility, and all of these physical qualities and how they need to be developed, can you guys talk about what does your curriculum look like in terms of the physical qualities and how you're developing them um, from middle school into high school? And then also, I want both of you within your school district, so Scott and Chad, Doug and John, share this conversation about how you guys collaborate and communicate with each other about making sure that that pathway syncs up from middle school into the high school levels. Um, our school uh, a year ago, it was, it, um, we're, we're, we're still, I mean, I've been here for 19 years, but we're still developing. Um, a year ago, they gave me a stipend position to work on alignment between the middle school and the high school. Um, Physical, edu physical education curriculum and um, last year was John's first year and uh, I, I was freed up to go down there and and see what he was doing and have conversations what he was doing and it was actually pretty easy because most days um, sometimes I wouldn't even tell him I was coming other days I'd let him know uh, he was putting in pro teaching progressions that I would have been using with freshmen and uh, we'd have conversations I stole some of his progressions um, but that our, our district's really committed to uh, that vertical alignment between the middle school and the high school. And so that, that really allowed us to do that for the first time since I've been here. Yeah, I think for, for us, it was um, a really easy transition. Um, Chad runs our middle school program now and Bill Price, who's on here too, both those guys help out um, one of our middle schools, but Chad actually, when he came to the district, he was a former strength coach and Bo was also at their previous schools. Um, but when Chad got hired in Farmington, he was at, at the high school with us to begin with. Um, so he knew, you know, what we were doing and, and kind of what we're doing with our freshman class, especially. Um, and then when he moved to the middle school, you know, we coordinated things and he asked specifically, you know, what kind of things should we be working on? What do you want our kids to be able to do? But he had a, he had a great handle on what we were doing already um, and kind of knew what it would be to, to get those kids prepared as well. So that, that helped uh, tremendously, I think, for us. Yeah, so, so let's let uh, John and, and Chad have a little voice here as well. And I'm curious to know when these sixth or seventh graders come in, 
like what do typical you know first six months or the first year look like uh with these young people in terms of how you're teaching what you're teaching and again um trying to be specific to strength power plyometrics speed development agility Uh, so we kind of have it broken down in two sections. Uh, we've got our regular PE groups and then we've got uh, like our weights and conditioning group. Um, so in there, again, a little, little bit different. Uh, the regular PE classes are going to be a little bit more uh, sports based. So within that, we try to work a lot more of our movement skills, just our technical skills. Um, so we'll do a, a lot within our, our warm up of our, our prep, uh, just learning how to do body weight movements, learn how to squat, learn how to hinge. Um, we you know, push ups, uh, uh, pulls. We're trying to just get them to learn how to move correctly. Uh, all of our dynamic warm up stuff starts out again uh, movement mechanics, uh, core strength, um, kind of again, those basic foundations uh, so that, that when they get seventh and eighth, we can kind of progress those a little bit further. Um, so only seventh and eighth graders are allowed to take those weights classes. So now we can add a little bit more. Again, we, we, we go into the weight room, we go through our full, what we call our block zero program. Uh, so now we start to load some of our base patterns and we've got specific progressions in place for each pattern. Um, and then once they're able to get to a certain level, we'll progress to an empty barbell. Uh, we get to an empty barbell on those base patterns and then we'll start to load. Uh, so like the so sixth graders are not allowed to take that, uh, that weights class well yet, uh, but it gives me an opportunity to kind of work it in with all of our students. Uh, so right now I've got, you know, half our, uh, half our school. So I see about 450 students um, throughout the year. So it, it gives me an opportunity to kind of hit, hit uh, a vast majority of our students to get them at least moving well. Um, again, learning how to stop, learning how to start. Um, you know, our basic pattern, look remote, uh, look remote patterns, shuffles, uh, crossover steps, um, skips. I mean, just, just learning how to, to move. And then we can kind of start to apply those into some of the, uh, the sports programs uh, within PE classes. And then again, as they go up to seventh and eighth grade, we get into the weights class. Now we kind of start to actually add some speed and agility uh, mechanics to it. We kind of start to do again, uh, basic starts. We'll, we'll now start to do from uh, different positions. So now three point stance, two point stance, um, half kneel. So we start to get those basics in. Again, that learning how to stop. Uh, so anytime we go to break or decelerate, we learn, hey, you know, what edges, inside edge, outside edge, things like that. Uh, we apply metrics. Uh, we always learn how to stop first. So again, athletic position uh, into learning how to decelerate or catch yourself. And then we'll start to progress into some of our jumps. Um, again, th and that kind of start, the jumps typically end up uh, progressing into that more of that weights class uh, versus again, just the, like the snap downs, the, the uh, learning how to break is a little bit more in those six, those early sixth to seventh graders. And then the seventh and eighth graders kind of advance that a little bit more. So hopefully they'll have all those like base movement patterns or movement efficiencies. Uh, so when they get up to the, to Doug at the high school, he can kind of just rock and roll with them because he's got some really cool things uh, for those guys as they, uh, as they continue to progress up. Yeah, great. Doug, we'll, we'll get to some of those cool things later. Okay. I know you're probably itching to talk about some of that stuff. Uh, I think it'd be great for everybody to hear some of the things that you're doing. Um, at the high school level as well. So, uh, John, th thanks for that explanation. So, uh, Chad, how about at Farmington? Um, yep. So at our middle school, we have a, <clears throat> an eighth grade strength class that students can take. So we currently have about 256 eighth graders and 165 of them are our strength class <clears throat> that they can take on top of the regular FIAD class that they get during a day. So they have two FIAD classes on their schedule, um, which has helped with <clears throat> excuse me, keeping um, PE staff, um, you know, having numbers and having sections to offer. Um, so that with the eighth grade, it is a phase-based program. So we start with sort of like John said, how to hinge, how to move, how to squat, uh, a lot of body weight exercises. Um, and then they progress sort of as they go, because we all know with middle schoolers, they're all, all over the map of, you know, what they can handle, um, what their coordination level is. So um, as they go, uh, luckily for us, we are a one-to-one -one school district, so every kid has an iPad. So we use those iPads a lot for train her to send them their programs, um, but then the kids actually videotape themselves and give themselves feedback right away of, you know, here's what we're looking for, 
how are you doing? Where are you at? You know, what do you need to get better at? Um, sort of that reflection that they're always, you know, what do they need to do? Because when I have 36 kids in a class, I can't get to every one of those eighth graders, to sh you know, to break down what they're doing well and what they got to improve on. So, um, so that's sort of how we run our program. I also do a sixth and seventh grade morning program, which is a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday morning, uh, where I had 56, I think was the final count. There are three mornings a week at 6.45 a.m. And that's sort of the one where um, it's run a lot like our eighth grade strength, sort of dumb me down a little bit because it's sixth and seventh graders. But we spend uh, more time, especially now in the spring, but now with school getting closed, we started to really break down the speed stuff of, you know, what part of your foot do you use? And then sort of like John said, the starts, the stops, you know, hitting that athletic position. Um, big thing I always talk about is run soft. You shouldn't sound like a herd of cattle when you're going across the gym um, to just try to get them to understand how to, you know, move their bodies, use their feet. Um, so that's sixth and seventh grade, a lot of that. And then eighth grade with our strength class, it's only a 42 minute class. So it's pretty quick getting in. We basically just have time for a quick warm up, get the three lifts in, um, and then they're out of there. So. Great. There's a few questions here in the chat box and there's one that I want to get at because it deals with the linkage, you know, between what you guys are doing at the middle school and as those young people enter the high school, how do you track where each student is at individually? And obviously as you're tracking them, there's that communication piece as well, right? Um, so if, if each of you, somebody from each school kind of, or both of you from each school want to address like how you're tracking those students as they you know, are in middle school and then getting up to the high school level. So at uh, middle school I'm at, we have every kid in our strength class has a portfolio that they're given on it. It's a Google Doc, basically breaking down um, every phase. So like our phase zero, they have to um, show that they can do an RDL, an air squat, a goblet squat, and a dumbbell deadlift. And they videotape themselves, and there's a rubric sort of that goes to a single point rubric that they um, sort of refer to on each phase of the lift and things they need to hit. Um, and then as they think they're ready, then they come up, either send me a thing on through our it's a Google form they fill out saying, I think I'm ready to move and I'll go look at it. Or they just call me over and say, hey, let's look at this. And you know, I'll grab their iPad and look at their videos or I'll stand there and watch them as they do it and give them feedback. Um, and then as they are ready, then they move up. So like this, we were just starting our fourth quarter this year and I think I had about six or seven students that were already through phase four. So they've hit every Olympic lift that they need to know once they get to the high school. Um, but it's all documented on a portfolio on a Google doc. So parents love it. Cause I always send messages home. Hey, talk to your, you know, talk to your student. And you know, I get messages. Oh, my kid showed me how they're doing a back squat today in the form. And, you know, and our big thing is it's not about weights. It's about, you know, we're stealing years starting in the middle school. So as long as they get the techniques down, they have four years of the high school to start, you know, increasing that load and building on that strength, um, which can always be a challenge, especially when they get to those eighth grade boys, because they want to do more weight and do more weight and, um, you know, try to hold them back. So, so that's yeah, sort of how we document is they have a sort of a live document going all year long. Yeah, great. I, I just posted something in the chat box about athlete management systems. So obviously there's several, you know, commercially available athlete management systems. Some of them have quite a price tag that not many high schools and middle schools uh, can afford. Um, obviously you can use Excel. It seems you guys are using Google docs, you know, for that athlete management system. Um, but, uh, the, the follow-up question then is before I turn it over to the Traverse city guys. So, so Scott, in terms of what Chad is doing at the middle school with the tracking, you know, obviously you're seeing those results as they enter into the high school as well. So can you just maybe talk to how you might be using some of that information as those kids are coming up into grade nine? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, Chad, Chad and Bo both are making my job so easy. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, when I, when I get uh, some freshman classes in, um, you know, th things are, things are really set. It's, it's amazing. Um, and just this spring, I had a new freshman uh, fitness for life class start. And, you know, we got big classes at the high school too. So I think the, that class was a 
is about 40, 39, something like that in the class. So we're the very first week, we're just kind of going through intro and learning lifts and things like that. And, and immediately, you know, I've got kids that are helping each other. They're critiquing their performance. Uh, the ones that have gone through, you know, Chad's program there, they're, they're helping each other. They're teaching each other right from day one. They're just in the habit of analyzing how they're moving and, and helping each other. So that's been just um, phenomenal. You know, and like you said, we use Train Heroic, so I've got all their numbers from middle school, so I can go back and, and run reports if I need to or look at kids. Um, but really, the, the teaching part has been fantastic because a lot of kids come in knowing what to do, so then I can really focus on those true beginners that didn't lift in the middle school and, and took the fitness class. Um, it, it frees me up for a lot of time to work more one-on-one -on -one with those kids that need the extra help. Yeah. So, so again, before I pass it off to the Traverse City guys, I just want to stay on with what you guys are doing. You mentioned using Train Heroic. So that's kind of also functioning a bit as an athlete management system, if you will. Obviously, that's a strength and conditioning platform. But um, for those not familiar, um, besides strength numbers, are you guys also inputting any other performance metrics, uh, speed, agility, mobility? And then the question I also have is what about what about height and weight and calculating growth rates and or maturity status? Um, I don't, you know, we, that's not something we track, I guess, you know, the, the growth spurts are going to vary from one kid to the next. And it's, you know, it's something that's always going to, going to happen. Um, you know, with my class at the high school, we do some more tracking with speed uh, 40 times and vertical jump, stuff like that. Um, but, we really haven't looked at that and I'm not sure if Chad really testing those things or not. It's more form and technique and, and getting them ready for, for high school athletics. Great. I think, I think more of our testing is happening at the high school. Um, we, we, about two or three years ago, we started tracking relative strength and relative power. Um, and so that's, it's not that one rep max and stuff like that's not has, doesn't have value. But I found more value in uh, relative strength and relative power and tracking that throughout the year and being able to show growth. Um, it's really helped get buy-in from our kids because when they see the results, um, it, I, I think it, it, it gets them to really understand what's going on and, and that they're seeing that improvement. Um, we also test flying tens, we test stationary tens, and we test 40s throughout the year too. Um, but we're in Northern Michigan and so we're supposed to get two or three inches of snow tomorrow. Um, so. Not, not that I'm in school right now, but if we were, it's usually early, earlier in the year before it gets too cold. And then spring is really when we start doing more of the longer sprints. Um, but we, we, we test flying tens about once every other week or so in class. Yeah, so how about at the middle school, John, um, in terms of like going back to this question about tracking individuals? Because uh, before yeah. you, were, you were talking obviously a lot about just, you know, building movement competency. Um, so maybe kind of addressing how you're kind of assessing and or tracking that so that of course, when they get to the high school, um, you know, Doug has a solid foundation to work with. Uh, so, um, again, we didn't have the resources yet for, uh, some of the nicer software that's out there. Uh, so we use Excel, um, and I've kind of made a, uh, a version of the DWMA, the dynamic, uh, warm up. Uh, movement assessment by Mike Buley. Um, and so I kind of use those for some of our movement patterns for some of our kids. Um, and so that kind of lets me track, I can keep track uh, as we go each week, in general for each kid, hey, how are they moving? Um, what deficiencies do they have? And so again, I kind of look more from a group perspective. I, like I said, I, currently I've got about 40 to 45 kids in a class. So it makes it a little bit difficult to, to try to go to individual. So I kind of look at the bigger picture, bigger group, uh, what's the bigger thing that we're struggling with? Um, is it a mobility thing? Is it a stability thing? Is it hip, ankle? Um, and so we'll put a little bit more time into those things. And then again, it's, it's, it's a working document, right? It's a working program. So as we start to see some of those things get better, all right, well, what's the next weak link? And then we try to work on that. Um, we, I don't time um, our tens yet. Cause I, I mean, I don't have enough space to do anything longer than about a 10. And I don't want to do a stopwatch 10 because it's just so inconsistent. Um, so again, for them, it's more of, I want to check their mechanics and I make notes on each kid, um, kind of where they're at, what, what things they're struggling with. 
Um, when it comes to the weights class, they're a little bit more structured. I've got a little bit less. I only have about 30 to 33 kids in those classes. Um, and again, same things. It's all on our base pattern. So like goblet squat, um, we'll have our uh, inverter row. Um, we'll test uh, dumbbell deadlift. Um, and then, so we've got those base, those four base patterns that we can kind of see, you know, again, it's more of a checklist of uh, are they doing it correctly? And so again, they know what those are and we check those off for each kid and everyone has to have proper movements in order to go again, go to our barbell. Um, last year I was actually, I had a really, really good group uh, in most of my classes. So we ended up getting a, a working max basically uh, for our bench our squat and our deadlift. Um, and again, using the relative weight, uh, we use Excel to kind of track everything. Um, so the kids were able to put in their weights that they track each week as they go. Um, but we kind of, you know, started out empty barbell and they got to slowly lowered as their form was there. And like I said, we, we ended up getting a, a max for them. So I can send all that information up to, to Doug at the high school. So he's, um, and kind of see kind of where those guys are at, at relative body strength. Um, and he knows right away, again, the biggest thing as mentioned before by Chad was it's all about movement patterns and how well they move. I don't care about the weight and they, I'll tell the kids every single day. It's not about the weight. It's about how well you do it. And so I kind of focus more on that. And that's where, again, I can spend a little bit more time with each kid. When I see some things, I make those notes that, uh, that I keep uh, as they progress and we can kind of go back. Hey, remember week, uh, you know, week two, uh, you were having issues here. Um, you can kind of see the difference uh, as we now progress. So um, yeah, it's a little bit more, uh, it, it's a little bit more handwritten. Um, so that the kids kind of know like, you know, what those, I say those deficiencies are. And then, so what they're needing to do to kind of correct those. And this is, this is my first year having athletes that John worked with. And it, I, 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 I totally agree with Scott. My job became very, very easy this year. Any of my students that had him within a couple of weeks to a month, they were on technique wise with all my kids that I already had. Um, my, my students that haven't had John or didn't have John, um, it took about three, four months before I was really getting them where I felt comfortable on some of the, the basic stuff to move on to the more advanced things that we do in class. Yeah, I, I've witnessed the same thing um, several times. So a question I wanna pose to you guys, you know, there might be people on today or who are gonna listen in the future and you know, they may be the only person at that school. Uh, so what words of advice would you have if you were at the high school level and there was no existing uh, program at the middle school, what words of advice would you have for these individuals within their school or their community to really push an advocate for beginning a upper elementary middle school strength and conditioning athletic development program? Well, it's, it's funny because uh, uh, I've been to Minnesota. I've watched Scott train his athletes and I always see Scott sharing videos of what their middle school athletes were doing. And I would take those videos to our administrators um, and show them that th this is what can be done at the middle school. Cause a lot of people, they, they treat the middle school athletes like they're glass. And I'm like, I'm like, I have a, I have an eight year old daughter that can do a lot of these things already. And, uh, uh, but I'm just a PE teacher. Like I always, I, I say it jokingly, but I'm just a PE teacher. But the more I started showing what they were doing, the next thing I know, um, I got a lot of leverage. And one of the biggest things that for me to get it really going is we started offering all the way down to fourth and fifth grade uh, in the summer, we ran a summer camp and we just, all the things that John basically described, we have 11 pound bars, we have lightweights, we like just teaching them how to move. Um, and that, that I think is, is creating more demand for our middle school and putting pressure honestly on our, our middle school administrators to create more space for this at the middle school level. Yeah, and I think even um, you know promoting it from the fitness side of things, not necessarily for athletics and in football or whatever kids play. You know, approach it from a fitness standpoint and a lifelong, you know, activity. And you know, you've got administrators and people that you know exercise themselves and are active, and they see the value of that. You know, and then also promoting it is not just for you know boys; it's for everybody. It's girls are is just as important for females as it is for males, and. And it, it's a lifelong thing that can greatly benefit them. And especially now, you know, we're seeing all these health issues and uh, with the virus and stuff. So being healthy is extremely important. So 
I think promoting that fitness side is, is really big. Yeah, Scott, I, I, I love to hear that just because, you know, when we use this term long-term athlete development, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. And so to, to hear you say, hey, it's more than just the athletic part of it, right? Or what we typically will think of the competitive athletic part of it. And it's really for everybody and for all. Like that, that's really an important message, I think. So there was a question um, and I wanted to get to this as well because sometimes we get stuck in our strength and conditioning silo. And you guys have great programs. But the fact is these kids are also going out and they're playing and they're obviously playing in their sport. So the question relates to what about assessment and consideration of overall training load and workload? And it gets into my piece about how do you guys communicate with the sport coaches within your program? And I'm assuming we're going to have to talk a little bit about educating them as well in terms of what you guys are doing. So there's a lot to that. So I'd like to hear what's going on at the middle school and at the high school. At the middle school, um, <clears throat> you know, since we don't focus a lot on the strength part, it's more just the movement part and the technique. Um, I get a lot of the traveling coaches that will send messages through their athletes saying, please don't make them lift because they have a big tournament this weekend. It's like mm -hmm. they're not doing anything Friday morning in strength class that's going to affect them either Friday night or Saturday morning. And if they are, then they haven't been doing anything right in class. So um, it's more just educating them that, you know, I – refer them to Scott's Twitter feed and say, Hey, look at our football varsity football team lifts Friday before games, you know, at four o'clock we're in that, the, you know, doing a pregame lift to activate everything. And so you're telling me now I shouldn't have a kid lift in class because they have a tournament that weekend or, you know, a game that night and um, just sort of refer them that, you know, I'm the head wrestling coach also. And we push our all my wrestlers to be in strength class at the high school. So they're lifting four days a week including days that we have matches. You know, it's, if they train right, they're going to be fine by the time um, that competition rolls around at night. So a lot of it is just having those conversations either with the families or those traveling coaches. Cause at the middle school, we don't have, I think there's only three middle school sports that are school-based now everything else has gone to the clubs. Um, so trying to get, having conversations with those coaches or families of, you know, the misconceptions of they're going to be too sore, too tired to be able to perform at their best. Yeah. So just interject really quick. When you talk about the educating of the parents as well, do you do that formally um, by being invited maybe to, you know, we have these, you know, preseason meetings that the coaches hold. Do you do that formally in that realm or is it basically through other modes like social media or emails and, and things of that nature? Uh, since we only have three middle school sports, they don't really have that preseason meeting that I could go to and just kid them all at once. So it's more email and, you know, Twitter stuff, or if I see them in the community, um, you know, I, during our conferences, I'll do all my conferences in the weight room. So I invite parents to swing up and chat with me and some of those conversations happen there. So. Yeah, I've had in the past a couple meetings, preseason meetings, coaches will ask me to come in and kind of explain to parents, you know, what it is that we're doing in the program and the philosophy. Um, but I think now, you know, at, with social media, you know, people kind of know what it is that we do and, and the word gets out, you know, with older siblings that have gone through our program, you know, they understand what we're doing. The coaches uh, have been through it a lot now and realize what it does for their athletes and how it doesn't really hinder performance. We're, we're monitoring that closely enough where, um, you know, if most of the time I'll get questions individually from students, uh, I mean, from parents, you know, I'll just contact them directly or if I see them in passing. But um, I think for the most part, people, people kind of understand what we're doing and, and how it all works. Um, they, they invite me to a lot of the coaches meetings. Um, it's, it's been a real, like, the funny part about my job is I, I was never hired to be a strength coach. Um, I just kind of took it and uh, they didn't pay me for a long time. And, um, but uh, they now actually invite me to the coaches meetings in the spring and the winter and the, and the, and the fall um, to kind of explain what we're doing. And the, the thing about high school sports now, especially is there's, I find a lot of turnover where coaches are leaving and um I, I get in a really good spot where I get buy-in from all my coaches and then a new coach comes in and I have to sell it to them. Um, but 
uh, biggest part for me is our, my administration, um, the support that we get from them. They actually push the kids, the athletic director, like I, I've gone through our three, three different principals and three different ADs in the last like eight years. And um, all three of them have been essential. Um, without them, we wouldn't have what we have right now. And so get, getting them to push the coaches has also been beneficial for us. Yeah, just, just interject again, and I'm just going to highlight that because that's so important, isn't it? Like when we talk about this idea of long-term athletic development, it's always athlete-centered, coach-driven, but administrator-supported. And you're very fortunate that you have an administration that really supports this as well because, you know, in other cases, there's not that administrative support. And it can make getting everybody on the same page with this idea much more challenging. It, and when we first started it here, um, our facilities were bad. Um, the buy-in was bad. The coaches, uh, it, it, was, it was a really bizarre situation where the fall athletes didn't want people to train in the fall because they were in season. And then the winter coaches didn't want them to train because it was in season. And the spring didn't want it. And then they went to camps all summer. And so they expected to get development in about a two-week window in the summer. And uh, – we, we've now gradually evolved where we're essentially year round training. Um, we give them dead weeks and they have off time, but we have, they have access to our facilities year round. And uh, it's, it's really changed our program um, from, we were kind of the, the, uh, the, we were the weakest program probably in our area to where we're now one of our, we're consistently one of the stronger programs in our area. Yeah, so uh, John, do you want to address anything related to this idea of, you know, the, the overall training load at the middle school um, and then obviously how you communicate and integrate in with some of the sport coaches? Well, so we have a really weird program at the middle school here where they don't really have middle school sports. It's like this hybrid of like we're using the middle school facilities, but it's kind of a, a club style uh, set up. So it's, it's kind of a weird hybrid that they run. Um, so again, we've got a lot of turnover with the coaches. Uh, but one of the things I was kind of surprised with when I came in last year was I was waiting for kind of that blowback with some of the coaches with this, but I didn't get any of that. Um, the coaches were actually pretty supportive. I've got several of them that kind of, again, encouraged or helped push their kids. Once they knew, hey, this is a, a good program that we're starting to put together, uh, the kids are actually lifting. A lot of the coaches were on board and were, were really trying to push their athletes to train uh, all year long, including in season. So it was really kind of nice to get that, that feedback. Um, we also, again, we monitor, uh, those athlete loads, the volume to make sure that there's never going to be an issue <laughs> after school, uh, where they're running into those types of things. Um, we've never had an athlete complain that again about soreness or fatigue or, um, any performance issues. Um, now I've try, try, been trying to reach out to some of these other coaches as well. Kind of same thing. Hey, if I get more support from them, same thing with the parents, uh, we sent a couple of uh, school-wide emails trying to get a little bit more encouragement or support from our parents to kind of funnel more kids into, especially our uh, our weight selectives. Um, you know, so again, it's a little bit more practical for them from that long-term uh, development approach, and then of course for um, for their overall fitness throughout the end of the, the rest of their life. So we want to make sure we they have that skill for for themselves. But we. Uh, we've been trying to kind of push that a little bit more this year. And of course, you know, got a little stuck here with the, uh, the virus going around, but um, so far, like I said, the community support has been great. Parents have been really supportive. Um, coaches have been pretty supportive. Uh, so admins kind of starting to roll on board with it. So it, it, again, we're pretty young in this uh, development for the middle school. Like I said, it's only year two that we've really been trying to push, but just within a year, we've gotten a ton of things done. And Doug has been fantastic about laying out all this groundwork from, uh, you know, his administration and ours, and then the district as a whole has really been fantastic with, hey, you guys kind of, you guys are the experts. You guys make sure you're, you're on the program the way you feel is best, and then we're going to support you from there. And so I've never had any blowback from uh, anybody about trying to train uh, game day, um, uh, you know, tournaments, anything like that. So it's been fantastic. Uh, one thing that we do for load and uh, we're, we're just probably six months into it is uh, I, every, every one of the platforms has some kind of questionnaire that the athletes take um, talking about readiness. Um, and so when I come to class, that's the first thing they have to do is they fill out their questionnaire 
Um, we have a scale that they weigh in and that, that, that that's for them, not for me, um, at least for now anyway. Um, but one thing that our program has is a body chart. And so when the athlete comes in, uh, they touch the part of their, if there's a part of their body that hurts, they put, are they sore? They put, or do they have pain? And so um, it, it gives me a, a heat map of um, green and they're feeling good, orange, not so good. If I see red, I can go more into detail. I can see each individual athlete. I click on it and it shows me what part of their body on a scale one to 10 is it like good, bad. And uh, so that's something that uh, it's come in handy several times. Cause like I said, we have, we have a lot of multi-sport athletes at our school and that's, that's really the beauty of doing it during the day. Like we are, cause we really get a lot of multi-sport athletes, but when they get run down, we were going to do a sprint workout and I, I noticed someone was red and then I, I, I looked at their thing. They hadn't said a word to me. Um, I looked on their thing and it, they said their hamstring. So I asked them, they said, well, I tweaked my hamstring at a basketball game last night. And so I was, I, we're starting to do the things um, to figure out where, how they're feeling to make sure they are ready for the workouts. But this is new to us this year. Prior to this year, we just used Microsoft Excel. Yeah, great. So I'm going to interject with another question here and Erica Suter uh, has been patiently waiting um, on a few questions here. Erica, thanks for the questions. Um, one question is directed ex towards the middle school uh, coaches. So how many months do you begin to load movement patterns in your program? And is it case by case uh, or a set time frame across the board for every kid? Uh, for me, it's case by case because they have that sort of that ongoing document I talked about earlier. Um, so that when I see a student is ready to move up to the next phase, um, then they will move up and they might move and their partners that they were lifting with might still be back at the phase before. So for me, it's all case by case. Yeah, same. I kind of have a general template. Like I said, our um, general body weight block zero program, uh, I try to run about four weeks. Um, now within that four weeks though, kids can progress much faster or they could take a little bit longer. It's all about mastering that movement pattern first. We talked about before, like, you know, it's not about the load. Um, so individually they can be in different, different places. Good. Erica, uh, satisfied with the answers to that? Want to follow up at all? Head nod. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> uh, her second question, um, and this actually relates to this past Tuesday's um, LTAD chat on Twitter where we covered plyometrics. So Erica's interested in what types of exercises as well as the set rep schemes for plyometrics for middle schoolers. And I, I want to get the high school guys back involved as well. Like when you guys are thinking of this scheme for let's say plyometrics in this setting and you're talking about the exercises and the set rep scheme, again, how much communication is there between the two of you? as well. So let's first just talk about the exercise and the set rep schemes at the middle school level. And then if the high school guys want to jump in and talk about how you guys converse about, you know, what that progression looks like from the middle school up into the high school. So I basically copy Scott because I work all summer with him. So I see, you know, sort of what he's asking when it comes to some of the plyometric stuff. And I just run with that of you know, here's what you're going to do this summer when you go to the summer program. So we're going to sort of copy that. And um, so for the plyometric stuff, speed stuff, it's, I always tell the kids we shouldn't be tired from this um, because it's about, you know, building that speed, it's not meant to gas you. So we're going to take plenty of rest in between so that you're recovered and um, you're going to give max effort each time, but we're going to give you plenty of break time. Um, and it's sort of the same thing in the way it's everything is three sets of eight to 10 reps um, with, when we try to, we have them on a clock um, that we rotate them all together. And the big thing, and I know Bo struggles with this too, I struggle is slow down. It's okay to take rest time in between your sets. It should take you the full eight or nine minutes for the three of you to get through the lift. Um, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be four minutes left on the clock. So you did, you know, whatever it is, nine sets in five minutes. It's a little too quick and you're not doing it right. And, you know, use that rest time. So. Good. Yeah, we're kind of the same. Actually, we'll, we're usually uh, three to four sets. Uh, we'll go anywhere between five to eight reps on plyos. Uh, some of our progressions, actually, I think I posted this uh, earlier. Um, we start real basic, just learn athletic position. Then we'll go snap downs. Um, I'll go to a single leg snap down. Again, learn to control that body weight. Um, I'm looking for body positioning. 
and then from there uh, we'll actually do a uh, a depth drop off the the uh, benches and again i'm looking for can you break can you land in that athletic position mm -hmm. um then from there we'll go snap downs to a box jump so there's a little bit of that pause again can you maintain that body position on the snap down up onto the box uh and then typically once they've mastered that one then we'll kind of go to uh, a little bit more true plyos we'll do more verticals we'll do uh um linear so we'll go over hurdles we'll do some some lateral jumps and again we always go double leg to single leg um but you know again it's and some of that the the progressions we have built in place some athletes will never get to the end like we talked about in, individually we might have to slow some kids down within within our plyometric uh uh block so it kind of depends on where they're at At the high school, when I get them, um, but because I've, uh, we're really one year into this, I, I assume everybody doesn't know what they're doing. I assume everybody's not ready. And so we, we start with basic, basic plyos, um, no boxes. We don't like, we're doing ground contact. Um, we added RSI testing this um, in the last year where um, my goal is to differentiate plyometrics by what they're able to handle um, with RSI. But as of right now, I just assume that they need the most basic plyos. We do basic pogos and basic squat jumps. And um, I start, I honestly start very low contacts with them, maybe one set early on and we work to, to three sets. Um, uh, but um, try not to overdo them with the plyos. I, I, I think that's plyos are overdone to some extent um, and athletes end up getting hurt. And Doug, I'm going to follow up on something that you said there because it, it's always intrigued me. You know, you, you kind of, I can't remember exact what your exact words were, but you said, you know, you assume they know nothing, which is really interesting because here we're talking about this pathway, right? And, and you know that John's doing a really good job at the middle school. And so now you've said, I'm going to assume they know nothing. And, I, and we hear this from the college coaches as well, right? Like, you guys at the high school level run great programs and then you have kids go to the college level and what do the college coaches say? Oh, well, I'm going to assume they know nothing. And obviously as a coach, you want to get to know them and what their capabilities are, right? Cause you've not seen these kids, but you know, John is doing a good job. So the question is kind of, you know, how, if we're trying to create this pathway and you know, John is doing a good job or Scott knows Chad is doing a good job are we just using a one or two week, you know, kind of, let's just call it, you know, foundation. So you can see where they're at and they, they, they get to know you and you build that relationship and they understand you and your coaching style and the coaching cues. Is that what we're talking about here? Rather, yeah. than, re ra rather than really saying, you know, they know nothing. And again, you use yep. the word assume they know nothing. And yep. I think we, we just for context. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's that, uh, Again, this is like our John and I are still developing that relationship, and I, I've gone in and watched what he does, and it's it's almost creepy how I walk in and he's just doing what I want him to do a lot of the times. Um, but uh, as as we get more and more developed between the two programs, um, I I anticipate we won't have to uh, to re to use some of these regressions so much. But one of our dilemmas right now is. I get a, a class of 45 and 10 or 15 of them had John and then the rest of them didn't. So um, again, kind of figuring out where everybody is, is that that first two weeks is, is kind of, I, I'm feeling them out. Yeah. Same thing for me. And it's, it always, you know, every class we start over every uh, training season or training phase, you know, you're, you just have to assess what you're working with and the kids that happen to be in there at the time and what they can do and what they can handle. And then, you know, kind of adjust based on, on the group, but yeah, you know, we don't do anything super complicated either as far as plyos um, and speed. It's, you know, no matter who it is, it's always good to kind of revisit the basics, you know, at the start and, and revisit, you know, technique, basic technique, and then build from there. So even if we've got, you know, beginners in there with our super high end, you know, D1 athletes, maybe, you know, revisiting those snap downs and jumping techniques, stuff like that, you know, and then the rate at which you progress is kind of determined by the, the experience of the group. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn uh, the topics a little bit here because this has been very much physical centric. You know, we've talked a lot about speed and plyos and everything. And again, 
Erica's asking about mental skills. Um, she was relating it specifically to resistance training, but I'm going to open it up a little bit further if that's okay. Um, do you guys take any approach to developing mental skills? Number one, in the weight room or in athletic development with these athletes. So, you know, anything from goal setting, focus, visualization, relaxation under pressure, all those key mental skills, you know, are, are you guys doing anything? And then again, I want to weave in the sport coaches because I think that's really important here as well, because we get siloed, don't we? We do what we do with strength training and athletic development and the sport coaches do what they do. And if we want this true holistic model, we need to have that interlap interconnection between the coaches and, and you guys. So again, just address what's going on at, in your district with mental skill development or sports psychology, if you will. Um, it's, uh, it's something that our district's actually now invested in. Um, there's a Dr. McGuire, I believe his name is, uh, that, that, uh, I can't remember the name of the program now. We just started it <laughs> like two weeks ago. Um, but, but that's what the whole program is about. And, um, I, I got to find out what the name of it is. Um, but, uh, our football coaching staff is, is, oh, it's called positive coaching by uh, Dr. McGuire, um, where it's a, it's like a 13 week class and, and learning how to build that mental toughness and uh, mental discipline into the athletes um, and doing it in the, in the right way. Um, we're really just like, like I said, we've only completed two of the classes. So I, I'm no expert on what, what it is yet, but uh, it, it's something that one of our coaching staffs is, has bought into. Yeah, in, in Farmington, we've got a couple teams that are working with um, a private, um, you know, like sports psychologist and, and mental focus expert. And Chad, I don't know if wrestling has worked with, if you brought in Cinder or not, but, um, you know, it's, for us, it's mostly sport coaches that are kind of doing that on more on an individual or in a specific, specific uh, team focus. Um, for from my end with the our specific workouts you know i'll talk about specific things and and we do the triphasic training and i talk about really thinking about how you're moving and and you know explaining the why on why we do things for that but as far as um, mental side of sports performance for us i think it's up to it's pretty much the team uh teams that determine how much they're doing with that yeah uh bill nelson i'm gonna have you unmute yourself if you will and ask this question kind of have a looks like you have a follow-up or a spin-off and I, I i i like this as well because to me it also weaves in back to this idea of the cumulative training load because we know a lot of these kids are they're going to a club sport they might be going to a private facility and bill's kind of asking about rest and recuperation here so bill if you yeah i just wanted to kind of ask ask this question the way that you want to ask it yeah i guess it's <clears throat> kind of related to the you know, you're, John's talking about applying metrics and we're doing stuff with kids during the day and then they may go to a, a school ball after school and they may go to a training practice later on, you know, and they're doing this <clears throat> throughout the week and then weekends come and they get to their travel games. You know, they may have games or uh, competitions or whatever it may be. And then we turn around and get them to Monday again and they go through the same thing. Well, we've got a lot of kids who are doing stuff in class and then, and that's tremendous. And I'm not, I think it's phenomenal, everything that's going on, but it's, I also, I've got a couple of random kids that are just like, they walk around lackadaisical, not lackadaisical, but they're kind of in a trance because it's a nonstop, you know, doing stuff for us during the day. And then their parents may throw them over to a, you know, helicopter trainer that they don't have a clue what we're doing during the day. Then they go to a practice, you know what I mean? And then they go to a game. So it's like, where do you kind of pull the plug and say, hey, you got to back off a little bit because more is not always better. Does that make sense? And I guess I mean, we, we tend to focus more on the strength side of things because I think from a plyometric, at least for some of those kids, I mean, there's a lot of those kids that aren't getting all that. You know what I mean? But that's kind of that fine line is where do you, where do you cut it off? Does that kind of make sense? Are you just asking um, – basically how we structure the class to work around the outside activities? No, I, I kind of have a, a good idea what you're doing. And I think it's awesome. I'm just saying 
what do you kind of do with those kids that that you know are busy nonstop? You know what I'm saying? I mean, do we kind of pull the plug back that we know that, you know, Bobby's getting thrown off too. You know, he's going from this practice to this practice to then another training session when they don't really understand what we have going on during the day. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I see more validity in what we're doing during the day, you know what I mean, than what John is talking about and Chad's talking about. And I'm talking with the younger kids, you know what I mean, than going forward with everything else going on. So uh, I would say, again, some of that is that communication with the kids. I can't control what they're going to do outside of school. You know, again, especially parents, have, if they're going to stack in like those three different, you know, they've got their – we'll say their school practice and then their travel practice and then all these other things going on. So those things are going to happen. So I'm the one that can adjust. So and I kind of agree. I think, you know, again, long-term for us, the younger kids, I'd like to see a little bit more of our development, but if I need to make adjustments, I see a kid dragon, he's tired, you know, he's clearly struggling a little bit. Hey, let's pull back today. You know what today let's, let's go back to body weight uh, or, you know what, let's just go through a, a, a yoga routine. So first, Again, some of those individual kids, uh, again, developing those relationships and then just talking with them. Hey, man, how are things going? How are you feeling today? Um, we haven't quite implemented um, that survey, that wellness survey uh, with middle school um, yet. So uh, so at this point, it's kind of that I can kind of see. We just go through the warm-up, you know, right? You can kind of look at your kids. You can kind of see, wait a minute, man. Uh, you know, Johnny's moving a little slow today or he just he just doesn't look right. So and, and having that conversation, hey, like, yeah, I had, you know, two games last night uh, from a, a club tournament. So, well, you know what, let's, let's, well, depending on how he's doing, let's drop the percentages or, hey, we'll cut volume down. Hey, you know, let's cut out a rep or I may, you know, depending on, on how bad he is, if he's super tired or super worn down, I'm like, all right, you know what, let's just do a, uh, a recovery, a, a stretching and, and mobility routine and call it a day. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's kind of individual. And understand, I'm I'm 100% on board with all of you guys. You know, I mean, I'm just curious on how we kind of, everybody has different situations, you know what I mean, as we go forward. So what I think you guys have is phenomenal, and I'm, I'm beyond jealous, as I told Scott and, and Doug that. And I think, you know, like John said, it's, it's really the communication tool, and then it's also with, with the kids being able to accurately self-monitor and be aware of, you know, when they're doing too much and when they need to dial back, and then being able to you know, communicate that with us too. So, you know, we're getting some accurate feedback from them and, and can adjust and they know when they actually need to adjust. One thing that, that we've, uh, the same thing is the, that communication. Um, we'll, we'll switch our workups up for individuals when they come in and we have that relationship where they, they're like, I'm beat. And uh, we have devices that measure bar speed and we'll change it up and say, okay, we want you at 50%. We don't want that bar to drop below 0.75 or we don't want that bar to drop below uh, 1.0 meters per second. And so we, rather than say it was going to be a heavier day, now we turn it into a lighter day and then they get that feedback um, in real time to make sure we are backing off accordingly and just tell them uh, to keep everything lighter on all the other things. So that's, that, I mean, that's in essence what we've done with them. Um, now, if it's every week, for like an entire year, that becomes an issue. Um, Cause we do have to have to load the body at times, but uh, especially when we have that level of trust built up with the athletes, we, we, we just, we just pivot and go to a different focus for the class. Yeah. Let's, let's wrap up here. And um, I want each group to kind of answer this question. Uh, three takeaways for a successful program that you guys have that runs middle school to high school three three important things three takeaways you know for developing and running a successful middle school to high school program um, I think just from the middle school hammering on the basics getting kids that can move and move well um, you know and promoting the program getting kids in the class and as many kids involved as possible and then, you know, promoting the program too with the, with the admin and getting administrators on support, other teachers in the building um, with support. And then, uh, you know, just progresses from there when the, the, the kids and everybody moves to the high school. And everybody wants to focus on facilities and we've really got, our facilities are very nice right now, but people are more important than facilities. Um, we, some of the best coaching I did was in our worst facilities. So getting, 
people that are qualified at the lower levels and then um, bringing coaches in, uh, the, especially in our summer program. Um, we're, we're, we're bringing in our cross country coach is going to be one of our coaches this summer, assuming we're allowed to do it. Um, two of our football coaches, a soccer coach where they get buy-in, they can see it and they understand what's going on. But uh, I don't, I don't want to be that guy that's in front of everybody. I, I want to have all our coaches involved and invested in it. And I, th I think the more coaches we can get involved, um, the, the more this is going to grow because uh, they will push their kids into it. Um, with our girls, the biggest thing, I, what, like when I first got here, we had one girl and now we're up to close to a hundred girls in our classes. The, the biggest thing with the girls is get them to sell it to their friends. They don't, they don't care who I am, but their friends and that, that social aspect for it um, has really grown our, our female population. And they're my best technicians. They're some of my best athletes. They're the most coachable athletes that I have. Um, but getting the girls to sell it to each other and finding a core group of girls that will lead, um, and it just starts to grow exponentially for you. Yeah. I, I want to ask one more question, actually, because it kind of relates to how you guys kind of sum this up. Um, what about going down into the elementary school? What kind of efforts have you guys made? You know, you, you, you saw what happens when you invest in middle school. But what happens now if we start investing in elementary programs and in our community youth sport programs? What kind of efforts have you guys made there? Um, in Farmington, it's our elementary PE teachers have been, some of them have been there for a long time. We got kind of a wide range of, of philosophies and some are set in their ways. Um, but Chad's wife is one of our elementary PE teachers. She's doing some great things. Um, one of our other ones, he's getting a lot of stuff from Jeremy Fritch and applying uh, those kind of philosophies and games like that and tag and, and uh, you know, obstacle courses and how to move. Um, it's just a matter, in fact, in, in Farmington, our whole PE department has not met district-wide in, in quite a long time. So I think that's something that we need to do a little bit better job of and in, in communicating from, you know, kindergarten all the way through seniors. Uh, our, our summer, pro we haven't really branched during the school year a whole lot, but our summer program, um, we actually worked more than I think we wanted to last year. We offered it, we offered a twice a week, hour, 20 minutes of speed and agility type stuff, 20 minutes of learning the weight room and, and, and with another coach and another, and we just kind of cycle them through. And within a month we sold out that class and had a request. And so we ended up with a hundred kids grades four through seven last year um, that we trained in, in the summertime with about, I think six coaches um, at different, different times. Um, but it, for our district, one of the biggest changes is some of those kids had parents that are PE teachers, they reached out. And so they're now ingraining it into the elementary PE programs um, and asking questions about what can they be doing differently? Because I think a lot of the elementary PE, like especially fitness testing type stuff is some of it maybe even a little archaic, um, but finding like he's finding bodies that are willing to change. Um, uh, having we, our district is, is a little bit older in our elementary. And so getting changed down there is a little bit harder, um, but getting it outside of the PE curriculum initially and then try to get it into the PE curriculum, I think is, could be huge. Yeah, good, thanks for your responses there, guys. Um, so thanks for, for sharing your guys' experience, your expertise on this topic. Uh, really good session uh, this morning. Um, thanks for the participation by people on the call. Again, this was recorded, if you wanna go back and look over it. Um, we're also posting these recordings, and I, I put that in, in, the, in the chat channel. Um, I'm just doing it on the back end of my personal website right now, but the LTAD chat live, and then also the Twitter chats are all archived there. So you can go back and, and look through both the Twitter chat and the LTAD, LTAD uh, chat lives like this one here today. Uh, the next one is gonna be on Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, I have some colleagues from the uh, English Premier League Academy system. Um, obviously, I think most of the people on the call today are from the U.S., so the Academy system is a bit different, 
but I think there are tremendous insights that can be gleaned on, on the integrated approach that they utilize. Um, so there's going to be a physiotherapist, a sports scientist, strength and conditioning coach, and they're also going to have one of the coaches on as well. And we're going to have a roundtable discussion about how they work together in an integrated manner um, for long-term athletic development. So that's Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern. And then Saturday, April 25th, uh, the topic is going to be coaching the youth and teen females. Uh, so Erica Suter, who's on the call today, will be one of the panelists, along with Krista Stoker and Ivy Casagrande. Uh, so that'll be April 25th. So um, again, you can find all this information on the links that I posted uh, in the chat. And um, keep following us on uh, social media channels in terms of updates as well. So. Thanks again uh, for the folks from Farmington, Minnesota, Traverse City. And yeah, I think as Bill Nelson mentioned, I think we're all jealous <laughs> in terms of what they have going on there. But I think you also heard Rome's not built in a day. It's taken a lot of time and effort. It's taken a lot of key stakeholders to buy in and a lot of uh, persistent uh, behaviors and communication and collaboration was obviously a key. So thanks again to you guys. Congratulations on great programs. And thanks for sharing. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Joe. Yep. Yep. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. All right. Have a good day, guys. Peace. Yeah.